Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at the Midway Church of Christ. Um, we're so glad to have you. Um, if you're a guest, thank you so much for choosing to be with us this morning. We, we hope that you will stay afterwards so that we can get to know you better and we can grow spiritually with you and become closer to you as brothers and sisters in Christ. But we're so thankful that you're here with us this morning. Um, our order of worship this morning, our singing will be led by Grant Addison. Um, our opening prayer will be led by Mike Morton. The lesson of the hour will be brought to us by Mark Howell. The Lord's Supper will be led by Mike Wolf, And the closing prayer will be led by Charlie Dunn. If you do not have an opportunity to grab a bulletin or grab a cup for communion, Hampton Hall will bring you one of those. If you'll just raise your hand up high where he can see you, he'll bring you one of those at this time. Um, it, at that time, if there's nothing else, we will begin our worship. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the Please bow with me for opening prayer. Holy Father, we're so thankful that we can assemble today and worship you. Father, we're always thankful to come in your presence, be in your house, and praise you, glorify your high and holy name. We pray, Father, that our worship today will be according to your will and accept on your sight that we can worship you in spirit and truth, keep our minds focused on you and not the outside world. Father, we're thankful for those who have <clears throat> have been sick. We're thankful that Joy's back with us, Father, and several others that are better. We pray that you will be with them, strengthen them, be with the ones who are about to have surgery, comfort them, help things go well with them, and guide the doctors that things will come out the right way if it be your will. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for Eddie and Randall. We pray that you'll keep them safe in Romania and that their mission will be successful. They can strengthen the church and lead more souls to you. We're thankful for our missionaries around the world. We know that a lot of them are in dangerous situations. We pray that you'll continue to watch over them, protect them, keep them safe, and help them to lead souls to you. We pray that you'll be with us today in our worship, that we can do things according to your will. We pray, Father, that you will forgive us all of our sins, things that we may do, may say, that uh, in the secret sins that we all have, Father, we pray that you'll guide us and forgive us and that we will make things right with you. Thank you, Father, for all that you do, for every blessing. We love you, your Son, the Holy Spirit, and we're thankful for every blessing. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. There is a name I love.
it seems like only about two weeks ago we were getting ready for uh, 2024 to come in, celebrating the, the new year coming in, and now it's all, already April. Can you, can you really believe that? April already. Now, when you think about the month of April, what do you think about? A lot of us, when we think about the month of April, we think about the idea of spring is here. And I'm thinking about that pretty well this morning because of the fact that when spring comes, they always have that pollen that comes along with it. <clears throat> and so it is working on me this morning. And so I think about that. But there are other things that I think about when I think about April and how it has arrived. Sometimes we talk about the April showers that bring May flowers. And we know that those are a, a thing. Uh, you may be thinking about today, uh, the, the eclipse that will be taking place tomorrow. Uh, that's taking place in April this year, and I think it's, what, 2044, before we have another one, that another total eclipse that will pass over the United States. But many of you will <clears throat> be able to see and, uh, some of the things, some of the effects from that tomorrow. And it may be that some, when they think of the month of April, think about April 15th, that is tax day. And when I think about tax day, I think about money. And when I think about money, tax day, you know, some people overpay their taxes, and so they will get a check back, and then some of the rest of us will continue paying what we owe to the, to the government. And so we think about money. And with that in mind, what I want to do in the month of April is to look at some things in regard to money. And, and <clears throat> we won't take just a, a, a day to, to talk about money itself. When we think about money, money's amoral. In other words, it has no idea about what is right and what is wrong. All of it comes to, to and from the people who use it. Uh, we, it. Money is an object, and we are human beings. We're the ones who, who do things with that money, and so the idea that we need to learn is how to best handle the money. Now we're going to be looking at one topic this morning. Next week we'll look at a, a different one. We're, we're, we're going to flip the script just a little bit next week. We're going to be talking not about generosity but about greed. The third week we'll be talking about stewardship. And then the last week of the month of April we're going to be talking about some ideas about money that young people need to, need to realize and need to know. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it's not just young people. The rest of us need those things as well. And so when we look at it, we're going to be talking about money during the month of April. If you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. We're going to focus on verses 17 and 18, and then we're going to have one part out of uh, one of those verses that we're going to talk more about this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19 is really where we, wanna, we, want, we want to read. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who is richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Now our focus this morning is going to be on verse number 18. And so let's look at a couple of things from that. Talking about those who are rich, the word, the first use of that word rich is the idea, it's in verse number 17, it's an adjective describing a person who has an abundant amount of something. And, and so that's what the idea is. <clears throat> a rich person is a one who has an abundant amount of something. But then there's another usage of the word rich. And in our passage in verse number 18, it, it's not an adjective as it is in the first verse, in verse number 17. But when he says be rich in good works, we're looking at a verb. We're looking at an action word. And so we're to be abundant. If we have an abundance, then we're to be abundant in something. And in this case, he says to be abundant in good works. But that's not where we want to stop. We want to focus this morning, as you've already seen on the title slide this morning, we want to look at that next little phrase, two of them in particular. He says that we're to charge those who are rich, who have an abundance in this world, 
And, and, and let me just stop right here for a moment. That's every one of us this morning. Every person sitting in this audience this morning has an abundance of things in this world. Compared to other places in the world, I know we say that from time to time. I know we may get tired of hearing that. But if you've ever been somewhere else other than the United States, that will make an impression on you. We are indeed, we do indeed have an abundance of things. And so we're talking to us. We're talking to, to, to you and to me. Okay? Now he says that we're to, to be rich in good works, but he also says something else. He says we are to be generous and ready to share. To be generous and ready to share. The word generous simply means to be liberal with what we have. To be liberal with what we have. That's the word that, that we want to focus on and the idea that we want to uh, consider this morning to be liberal with what we have. But we can't talk about being generous without talking about the last part of that phrase. Ready to share is the way that the ESV puts it. Ready to share. The idea behind the word, that's a single word in the original language. The idea from that word is simply to be inclined to impart what we have to someone else. To be inclined to have the desire, to have the want to, to give somebody else some of the abundance of what we have. And so we can't be generous, or I should say probably we won't be generous, unless we have that latter part as well. And when Paul writes these things to Timothy, and uh, thus to us, for us, for our <clears throat> uh, learning today, he, he is talking and giving us a, a, a direct order, if you will. He's giving us a command. It's not something we can do if we want to. It's not something that, well, if the feeling or the mood hits us, we can. God tells you and me, be generous and ready to share. And so as we talk about money, let's talk about this idea of being generous and ready to share. Our theme for the year, as you well know, is my world, my life, and my hope. And so let's go back and, and let's talk about the world for just a moment. And the world's idea, not about money, but let's talk for just a moment about the world's idea about giving or being generous. The world has some strange ideas about giving or being generous. Number one, somebody might say, well, it's mine, I earned it and I'm going to keep it. And, and you know what? That is the prevailing thought in our world. It's mine, I earned it, and I'm going to keep it. Or, or if, they, if someone didn't earn it, but they've somehow received it, it's still mine, and I'm going to keep it. And so we have that, that notion that's out there, and, and in many cases we've adopted that. Christians have adopted it, and it's not the right thinking. That's the world's thinking. Somebody else might say, well, why should I give what I have to someone else? I might not have enough, and I might run out myself. And then, you know, they may even use Scripture. And they go back and talk about, you know, those uh, ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. And, and uh, you know, there's the, the, the reason and given there for the five uh, wise virgins not giving to those who, are, who, are, uh, who fail to prepare. But we don't need to miss the point. He's not saying don't share. He's saying be prepared, be ready. That's his idea that, he is, that he's teaching in that passage. And so we can't use that and say, well, I, I can't be generous because I might run out myself. Do you remember the story in the New Testament about the widow who had two mites. She gave all she had, Jesus said. All she had. She didn't even know where she was going to get her next meal. And yet she gave it to God. And God provided. What about in the Old Testament? Do you remember the widow who uh, Elijah stayed with? Uh, she only had so much meal and, and, and he said, you know, if you'll, if you'll provide that, God will provide it. And the more she baked, the more meal she had. 
The more, the more that was there, and I'll guarantee you, God hasn't run out. God can help us as well. Not only does the world think that, but somebody might say, well, you know, if I am a generous person and I give to other folks, I'm just enabling bad behavior. Now, there's a lot of bad behavior in the world, is there not? I want to just say it out loud this morning. There are a lot of lazy people in our world. There are a bunch of deadbeats in our world. Now, God has a solution for those who refuse to work. And do you remember what Paul wrote about that? Let them not eat. And, and yet, when we think about that, there are still legitimate needs out there, aren't they? And, and, and so, well, I'm just enabling bad behavior. I could go on and on. Uh, there are some in our world who, who even harbor negative views about generous people. They may be jealous or resentful of someone who has enough to give to another. They, they may impute insincerity on them. They're just showing off. They're giving so that, that people will praise them. They may accuse them of being manipulative, manipulative, trying to get their own way through the generosity that they have. And, and there are some who would say a person who is generous is just being financially irresponsible. Financially irresponsible. Now there are a lot of, as I said when I started this, strange ideas out in our world. But that shouldn't preclude us from being generous. But then, not only my world, what about my life? How does what the world thinks about generous, generosity and generous people how does that affect me? How does that affect us as Christians? I'm going to tell you this morning it does. I believe that it does. And I believe that, that many people around us can see that as well. Well, when we think about the world and what people are saying, the negative things that are, that are said, when we're confronted with all of these negative views, you know what? We're less likely to be generous. When, when people look at us and say, you, you, you have lost your mind for being generous, and they say bad things about us, are we more or less likely to be generous? Human nature says we're going to be less likely. Not only that, but when we think about these things that, that are out here in our world and the way that the world thinks, one of the things that you can consider, and this is how it affects you, is that when being generous, you can expect to be taken advantage of. You can expect that. There are some people out there who are deadbeats. There are some people out there who do not care. They're simply in it to get what they can get no matter what. And so when we think about it, we can expect to be taken advantage of. Expect to be taken advantage of. And so, is that going to make you more or less likely to be generous? But then not only that, you can be, uh, when being generous, you can expect to be considered to be naive. To be naive. Now, what do you mean by that? I want you to know, if you haven't already figured it out, there are some universal techniques used by scammers and con artists that reveal their belief that the person that they're seeking something from is naive. Now, what do you mean? How, how is that? Think about some of the things that they do. They quickly try to build trust. A lot of times when people will come by here, come by the church building, looking for, for some help. And, and, and I want to hasten to say, and I'm going to say it again in a minute, they're, they're legitimately in need. And we legitimately want to help. But when, when they come in, you can begin to tell, to, to distinguish between who legitimately needs something and who's just trying to get something. Because they start talking about, you know what, my mama carried me to church every, every Sunday when I was growing up. They're, they're trying to, to, to build that trust. Now, they may not have been to church in 20 years, 
But my mama carried me when I was a kid, so therefore you, you ought to, we ought to have something in common. We ought to have some trust that we can build. Or I have a church member who, or a family member who's a church member. Now they've only seen them twice over the years, and they're, when, they, when they happen to have a family reunion, and they couldn't even remember their name, but, but they said, you know, I have somebody who goes to church somewhere. And, and so those are, you know, there are a lot of other things that they say, but I just use those, chose those, because they're very common when people seek help. They, they're seeking something from you. And, and they believe that, you know, if I can establish this, uh, this idea of rapport, this idea of building some trust with you, then... then I get something. I, I, I'll receive something from you. Now remember, we're talking about being considered to be naive. But we're talking about techniques that people use that show these kinds of things. They'll play on your emotions. There's always a list of something they've, uh, that they have, something that's happened to them, something that they're going through. Uh, they just can't seem to catch a break. There's six people in the house, and oh, we just really don't have anything to eat, except they have 47 packs of cigarettes, and they had money to get that somewhere. They'll try to play on your emotions. They, they will try to disguise their true intentions. I'm going to, and they'll tell you somewhere they're going, and I need some money for gas. I need money for gas. Okay, well, I'll go get, you some, go get you some gas. We'll go down to the station, fill up. Well, I don't need it right now. I got a full tank right now. I just need money for drugs or some other thing that they don't want you to know. You're naive. They try to create a sense of obligation. It's cold. It's hot. And so... You know, I need, some, I need my power bill paid. Now, there are people who need it. And I understand people will suffer. You know, somebody with a medical condition, somebody who's elderly, they don't need to be cold. Somebody who's, who has a medical condition, they need some cooling in the summertime, don't they? We understand that. We know that. But there's always some kind of thing. They create that sense of obligation. And then they try to put the immediate pressure uh, on you, or the, the pressure for immediate action. I'm going to get a job next week, but I need something right now. Right now. Two weeks later, they're back. Well, I didn't get my job, but I'm going to get one next week. I just need a little more. You know what that does? That makes people jaded and calloused. When you're played that way, those who should be generous are sometimes made calloused. And the generosity that we as Christians should be showing is deterred. You have to realize that even though you're counted as naive by some, there are still a lot of legitimate needs. And therefore, you must not allow the sinners to deter you from your responsibility that God has given you and me to be generous. We have to understand that. And until we do, we won't be what God tells us we must be. That's how the world's thinking sometimes affects you and me in this area, in the concept of being generous. This morning, I want to notice two things that might help us as we attempt to improve our generosity. Number one... Be willing to give more than you expect to receive. Be willing to give more than you expect to receive. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 20 at verse number 35. 
Acts chapter 20 at verse number 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus how he himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now how many times have you heard that, that passage? Have you heard it five? Uh, probably. Have you heard it ten? Have you heard it a hundred? Have you heard it five hundred? Have you heard it a thousand times? And every time we look at this verse... We like that last part. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And there's nothing wrong with it. We need to focus on what Paul said that the Lord said. This is not something that we can pass over lightly. The Lord said it's more blessed to give than to receive, and so I don't be happy about giving. But what I want to focus on is not that part of the verse. It's that word weak that we want to stop and talk about for just a moment. The word weak. In this way we must help the weak. Who are the weak that, we're being, uh, that, are, that are spoken about here? The word means to be without strength, to be powerless, to be sick. To have no strength, to be infirm. How's the word used in the New Testament? If you go to the book of Matthew chapter 25 at verse number 36... As we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus will say, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick. Same word. I was sick and you visited me. You took care of me. You helped me. You were generous in that way. In the book of John, chapter 5, at verse number 3, in these lay a multitude of invalids. The word translated weak. In Acts chapter 20 at verse 35 is translated invalids there in the book of John chapter 5 at verse number 3. And so these are people who have legitimate needs, aren't they? They're sick, they're, in, they're infirm in some way. They, they in some way can't help themselves. And Paul says, we must help the weak. But he didn't just say we must help the weak, did he? He said, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. Do you know what Paul did? Paul had labored. If you go back to verse number 34, just back up one verse. Paul said, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. Do you know what Paul did when he went to a place and stayed for a long while? Paul worked a job. What was Paul's occupation by trade? He was a tent maker. That's where we get the the term that we sometimes use today, preachers who also have a a secular job in addition to the one that uh, they have in preaching the gospel are sometimes called tent-making preachers. And the reason for that is Paul was a tent maker. When Paul went somewhere, Paul says, I showed you something in doing that. I, I not only took care of myself, but I took what I had and I helped other folks. And I set an example for you, for everyone, for us that when we work with our hands, we're able to help. You see, the help could come, at least in part, by the helpers and what they did through the laboring with their hands. Now, what is the point? Well, you and I, when we work our jobs... Hopefully we'll have some with which we can help other folks. And that's what he said. Through work would come pay. And this pay, whether given in money or other items of necessity, could help the weak, the sick, the infirm, the needy folks. Now, it's in this reference again that Paul cites the Lord who said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Did he not? 
Most of us remember the story of the man who was traveling from Jerusalem who was beaten up and robbed. Don't you? We don't call it by the name of that man. We call it by the name of another man. Or at least the description of another man. The good Samaritan. Two men passed by the one who had been beaten up, left for dead. Everything he had taken. Two men, two religious men passed by. We know the story. Then here comes this man who's a Samaritan of all people. And he stops and he helps. He stops and he, he, he takes care of his wounds. And we know the story. He carries him on and, and, and puts him into a place where he can rest and recover. How many believe the Good Samaritan upon seeing this man in desperate need, was thinking, I'll help him out, but I'm going to make a little money off of it. I'll help him out, but he's going to have to pay me back. Have you ever thought that when you read that story? Has any preacher ever, ever preached that to you? Now, I'm not preaching it to you this morning. I'm just asking, have you heard something like that? And the answer to that is no. And, and you know what? This man had some business to go take care of, didn't he? He evidently had a job, something that he needed to do. He had to leave this man behind at the end, didn't he? And he also left some money to take care of some more care for the man. He had labored evidently with his hands to the point that he was helping this sick, this infirm person. And yet, what did he expect to receive? How many people think that the, first, the Good Samaritan even gave the first thought about what he was going to get in return? None. He just did it because he was a generous man who took care, in the story he's telling, Jesus is telling, who took care of a neighbor because he was a neighbor. I may work hard to earn my living, but if my heart's right, when I'm generous with what I've been given, when I've worked with my hands, as Paul, as Paul put it, so that we can help those who are weak. I don't do it expecting to get. I do it expecting to give. No wonder the Lord said it's more blessed to give than to receive. That'll help us if we let it. Number two, give out of love, not out of obligation. Am I preaching this morning about being generous? Yes. Am I showing that the Bible tells me that I have an obligation to be generous? Shake your head this way. I am telling us that this morning. Don't leave here with any doubt. I am saying the Bible says we have an obligation to be generous. But if you leave here and you perform acts of generosity just because you're obligated to do it, then you might as well have not even listened to this sermon. And just kept on doing nothing. Because that's not who we are and that's not how we act. Look at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 at verse number 7. Now understand in the book of 2 Corinthians, especially in 9, 10, 11, all those chapters there, the Lord is talking about giving 
as a part of our worship, but he's talking about the use of it as well. So there's a lot that's there. He's talking about where we even get the money to be able to give to help others. But the part I want to focus on out of that grand discussion is found here in verse number 7. Each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, this idea is, again, under the heading of giving as we've been prospered, okay? What we've done, what we will done, or what we have, will do, or what we have done this morning when we came in or when we leave or whatever. But I want you to know it's also applicable to helping other folks on an individual basis as well. It's not just when we come on Sunday that we're to be cheerful givers. It's whenever we're a helper of another. Now there's some things that we need to consider from this passage. As we look at the passage, according to the passage, the giving is to be a decision of the heart. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. A decision of the heart. The word decided means to decide beforehand, to determine ahead of time, and and to decide upon something ahead of time. That's what the word that is translated here as he's decided in his heart means. You have given some thought to it, but you thought about it beforehand. Okay. Now, that's applicable again to to the giving to the Lord. The word that's used here is used only one time in the New Testament right here. The word translated decided here, it can refer to having decided what or how much that you're going to give. It can also refer to having decided with, the, with what attitude you're going to give. And a lot of times when we talk about this uh, passage, we, we talk about it from the standpoint, well, he's decided how much that he's going to give. But contextually, in the passage, is he not discussing the attitude? God loves a cheerful giver. You've got to decide, first part of the verse, God loves a cheerful... Is that not the attitude with which we're to give? Rather than the amount that we're deciding. Now we have to decide upon an amount. We understand that. That's a necessity too, but the attitude is just as much a part of it. We can decide to be stingy, or we can decide to be generous. We can decide to be, well, grudgingly give, or we can decide to open our hands and pour it out, because God has poured in more than we're pouring out. That's what we can do. The word cheerful here in this passage is used only here in the New Testament as well. It denotes being happy, glad, a cheerful state of mind. That's what it talks about. Is that the way we do it? Can I be candid and honest with you? When you talk to the brothers and the sisters after they've just heard a sermon on giving, I hear it too. Preacher's talking about giving again. He expects me to just 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 open up my, my pocketbook and just keep on and keep on and keep on giving. Oh, that's not the open and honest part open and honest part is this. You might as well have kept it in your pocket. Because God says I love somebody who wanted to do it. Who happily did it. And would happily give more if they had more to give. And again it's not just on the Sunday that we're talking about here. 
It's when we're helping others that this attitude must be in place. Giving to God is not done reluctantly, but giving to others must not be done in that way either. The idea behind reluctantly is not with unhappiness, marked by regret. That's part of the meaning of the word. Not with mental pain or anxiety or sadness. A part of the meaning of the word that is translated here, reluctantly. Giving to God is not a matter of compulsion. Are we to do it? Did God command us to? Yes. But He's not going to take your pocketbook. He's not going to get your wallet and open it up. He's not going to steal your checkbook and write the check out Himself. You have to make that decision. How much and with what attitude you're going to do it. What we do, or when we do not give out of love rather than obligation, it's almost as if we're paying a bill. We have that obligation to give, and so we're just paying the bill. I did it, I got it done, and I'm over with it till next week. When someone is genuinely in need and we help them just because we're obligated to make sure they don't starve to death, sort of like paying the bill, isn't it? One of the reasons for benevolence in the New Testament church was to help the brothers and sisters who were in need but also to help others. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. Why was that done? To hopefully bring those persons who saw the love, the compassion, the concern of Christians. To bring that person who's not one of those, who's not a Christian, to bring that person to Christ. And you know what people can sense when you're not giving out of love, but rather obligation? How many is that going to win? Good question, isn't it? You know what? When we're thinking about giving, this idea of being generous, giving out uh, out of obligation does not foster a heart of compassion. And don't we need a heart of compassion? Wasn't Jesus the most compassionate person who's ever lived on the face of the earth? He went about doing good. He looked at people when he saw them who were hungry and he wanted them fed. Sick people, he wanted them healed. He was compassionate upon them with their physical needs, but he's also compassionate upon them with their spiritual needs. And if we can't develop a heart of compassion on the physical side, how in the world will we ever develop a heart of compassion for the spiritual side? Answer that in your own mind. When we give to people in out of obligation, they can tell that you're not giving to them because we care about them, but simply because we feel we should or we feel we have to. We need to let them feel that we want to because we love them and we want their soul saved, not just their stomach filled. Let's Bring this lesson to a close. There are four passages that I want you to think about with me very quickly. They're in the Old Testament. Psalm, one of them from Psalms and one from Proverbs. The first one, Psalm 37, verse 21. The wicked borrows but does not repay, pay back. But the righteous is generous and gives. Who? The righteous 
If we want to be righteous, what must we do? Be generous. Proverbs 14, verse 21. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Blessed. Happy is the one who is generous. Look at Proverbs 14, verse 31. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Honors who? The needy man? No. In context, it honors the maker. Because you insult the maker when you're not good to them. And then Proverbs 19, verse number 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will repay him for his deed. I said a while ago, we don't give expecting to receive. That's not the purpose behind it. That's not what we need to be thinking about. But I am calling on us to think about it here. Okay? When we give, we're not necessarily just giving to the poor. The the wise man, rather, said, when you do it, consider it alone to God. And you know what? God's going to repay. And I might add this. I'm not an inspired person. But I know enough of the rest of what the Bible says. Not only is God going to repay, He'll do it with interest. And a lot of it. More than we could ever imagine. How many of you ever remember the old Twilight Zone? You know, the one in black and white created by Rod Serling? Well, there was, a, there was a one that first aired in April of 1960, April 15th, 1960. That was before my time, but I have seen it in reruns. The title of the show is A Nice Place to Visit. The storyline is this. There's a man by the name of Rocky Valentine who's a who's a thief. He's a small-time hood. He he robs a store and he gets shot by the police and dies. And he wakes up and and when he he wakes up, there's this man who is there by the name of Mr. Pip. And Mr. Pip has carried him to a a luxurious apartment. Uh, He has given him basically anything he wants. Now, this is... We'll just listen to the rest of it. This man's a gambler and he wants to gamble. And so, man, immediately there's a place for him to gamble. He's thinking in his mind, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. Because every time he gambles, he wins. And over and over and over and over again. And after about a month or so uh, of living in this luxurious life and never being able to lose and having uh, beautiful women who are surrounding him and everything he could imagine, he has become disgruntled. And, and he just can't imagine it could get any worse. Finally, he calls Mr. Pip and says, Mr. Pip said, I don't belong here. I belong in the other, I, I don't belong in heaven. I belong in the other place. And Mr. Pitt looks at him and says, whatever gave you the idea you were in heaven? Now the moral to the story is simply this. Here's a man who had figured out it's not what you get. It's who you have to share it with. Who you have to give to. That's the whole whole idea behind that particular episode. This is the other place. See, life's not all about getting. It is about giving. It is about being generous. It's not about whether we're happy or not, as in the Twilight Zone episode. It's about doing what God said. Life in one way, in one aspect, 
is about being generous as we make our way to the blessings of God. This morning, this lesson has not been one of an evangelistic nature, but if you realize that you need God in your life and you haven't obeyed the gospel, then the invitation is yours today. If you believe in Jesus, willing to repent of the sins that you've committed, would make that great confession, be baptized for the remission of your sins, we're here for you. If you're here and there's something wrong in your life that you need to make right, why don't you do that? Right now, as together we stand as we sing. It has come to that time in our worship service that we've been instructed to remember 
the sacrifice that Jesus did for us as he gave his life on the cross. So if you would bow with me now as we give thanks for this bread. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have set aside a time in the worship service on the first day of the week that we particularly concentrate on the sacrifice that your son did for us as he gave his life on the cross that we might have the forgiveness of our sins and that we might one day be able to live with you. As we partake of this, these emblems, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we might consider the pain and the agony and that he went through. And as we partake of this bread, which represents his body, we pray that we might do so in a manner that would be pleasing unto you. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Bear with me, please. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks at this time for this cup of fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your Son shed for us. And now as we partake of it, we pray that we might be able to center our minds on that scene where he shed his blood and that we might be able to take of this emblem in a manner be pleasing unto you. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, <clears throat> we've been asked also to give on the first day of the week. And since it's convenient to do so now, let's remember the blessings that we've been provided and the opportunity that we have to give back to God for what he's given us. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that in addition to the spiritual blessings that you've blessed us with, that you've given us those temporal and physical blessings that we can provide for ourselves and that in doing so that we can show our generosity and our benevolence to you and to others in giving back so that we can finance and fund the blessings that we need to give to others. Pray that we might do so at this point in time in a liberal manner, and we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Mr. Grant, thank you so much for leading us in singing. Mr. Mark, thank you so much for the wonderful lesson. Um, there's so many times each day that we have to show our generosity, and so I hope we can take what we learned this morning and we can apply it to our everyday life. Um, I don't have any announcements, any new announcements. Um, please remember that as we exit this morning, if you will, please grab a bulletin. There's some, uh, so many good things in there, so many uh, people who need our prayers still. And so I pray that you'll grab one of those and um, keep praying for those people. They really need our prayers at this time. Um, if there are no further announcements, um, our guests, thank you so much for being with us. Um, please remember that right after the end of our service, we will have an hour of Bible class. <coughs> So um, we would love for you to stay and also stay that we can get to know you better. If there are no further announcements, I have one more song and then a closing prayer.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you again thanking you for this day and thanking you for this privilege that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to hear another portion of your word and to sing your songs of praise. Father, we, we pray that the things that were said and done today are in accordance with your will. And Father, we ask now that as we depart from here that you'll watch over us, you'll care for us and see us safely to our homes and to whatever destination that we go to and that you will see us safely back here at the next point in time. Father, please forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.